Okay, looks like we have a lot of people. Um, apologies for the delayed start. We had some uh, technical difficulties, but uh, we're excited to get started. I'm Shannon McNulty, the uh, founder of The Village Law Firm and a trust and states attorney. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Jamie Wolf. Uh, Jamie, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, nice to be here with you, Shannon. Uh, thank you for having me on today. Uh, I've been practicing uh, trust and estates for about close to 10 years now. Um, I'm a senior attorney at the Village Law Firm, and before joining the Village Law Firm, I worked for an, a firm that represents the public administrator of New York County. The public administrator is appointed to represent or to administer estates uh, when, there is, when the decedent passed away with no will and with no immediate family members who are eligible or able to serve. Uh, before joining, um, before working for the public administrator, I uh, worked for a small firm doing um, all areas of elder law. So I've been in this field a long time and I've seen uh, quite a lot of uh, interesting cases. Yeah, definitely in the probate area, I feel is where a lot of the more um, interesting, we'll call them, <laughs> fact patterns that we see. And we're really glad Jimmy joined our firm last year, and we were really excited to bring her on um, for and to be able to benefit and for our clients to be able to benefit from her expertise. Um, I wanted to do this particular webinar because I feel like this is an area where there is so much confusion and um, and just a lot of misconceptions about what happens in probate. I feel like even unless you're actually doing probate work, that it, it's really um, hardly anybody really knows what exactly happens um, unless you go through the process. So I wanted to, I thought it would be helpful to just to do a webinar on um, kind of take a step-by-step -step of what happens happens in the probate process and some of the issues that come up come up and then also you know as we're looking at this this is where you know and this is why you know working with attorneys who gone through this process and uh, who are experts in this field is really important because a lot of our planning ideas come from our our experiences with clients so you know we'll have a client who this this didn't turn out right not because we had done it but just for um whatever happened what their planning had but then that we get it for the administration part and then we will then work that into our planning process to make sure that that doesn't happen with our clients and so i think that sometimes people um you know beyond obviously the tax expertise and the asset protection and all of those things of you know why do you work with a lawyer on this i can just go to legal zoom or wherever is because um, the people who are doing legal zoom is just one form and it stays pretty much the same forever. Uh, and this is something where you constantly kind of have to be responding to what is going on and just making sure that um, the planning that we're doing sets our clients up so that they don't run into some of the problems that we see in on the other end and sometimes there's not much you can do about it but as much as we can do there definitely can make a really big difference um so we're going to let me just uh share my screen here okay there's our slide this is us and these are kind of the first steps of so jamie let's go through like somebody passes away um what 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 is kind of the next step because a lot of times even like in our planet planning clients they'll ask us this like what actually happens like so if somebody passes away what what do you do and what are kind of the first steps that you you would take sure so the first step really is to determine the domicile or permanent residence of the decedent, because that's gonna dictate where the will is filed and where the petition is filed. Uh, so for example, if upon death, the uh, decedent was permanently residing in Queens, well then the petition is going to be filed in the Queens County Surrogates Court. Uh, but if the decedent um, was a permanent resident of let's say California, well then a California attorney will need to be retained and the proceeding will need to be commenced in California because each state has their own probate process and their own um, rules regulating that process. And how about 
within New York State? Uh, do, do, can people file anywhere within New York State or is it specific to um, the locality that they lived in? It's specific to the locality. The courts um, are very particular uh, about which petitions can be filed there. So the person needs to be living in that county in order to file in that county surrogate's court. And is there any difference? So if you um, filed, say, the, the decedent and the decedent is the person that passed, um, if they had lived in Manhattan or if they had lived in Westchester or they had lived in Queens or Brooklyn, is it all the same exact same process? Is it pretty much you would think it would be standardized across the state? Yeah, the, the, the process is for the most part pretty streamlined. The basics are going to all be the same, but each court does have their own requirements. So some courts might require certain documentation. Other courts might not require that, that same documentation, but require other information. So that's why it's really important to um, retain an attorney so that they can walk you through um, what each court needs. Yeah, and I, I know even just from my own experience of uh, you know working with one court and thinking that the same documentation would be required then for, you know, say from New York to Brooklyn and Kings County, and that it would be the same documentation and same forms and everything that would be filed in the other uh, same city. But that wasn't, that's not always the case. It can depend even on the day or the clerk uh, or the county that you're in. And, and from our, in our experience, the where you live, particularly within New York City, can vary dramatically in terms of how that smoothly that process goes. So, for example, in New York County, like that's probably best case scenario in terms of uh, the um, courts being pretty responsive. Uh, but in some of the other boroughs, it it can really just take many many times as long to do do the same thing. So that that really varies, and sometimes we'll take that into account when we're advising clients of when they say like how long does this take well if they lived in um in manhattan maybe it wouldn't take that long but if they lived in brooklyn or or in queens then it could take a lot longer okay so we got the residents of the decedent say i know they lived in kings county we'll say um what what is next so then you you call a lawyer um in new york and and sort of get that process started is that kind of the next step yeah that's the next step but you really want to determine if before even reaching out to attorney you want to <clears throat> maybe um, figure out what type of assets the decedent owned. And for our purposes, I'm going to classify them into two categories, probate and non-probate assets. Um, because if all of the assets are non-probate assets, um, then probate likely will not be necessary. There, there may be certain situations in which even if there are non-probate assets, you still need to go through the probate process, but that's, that's more outside the scope of this presentation. Um, so probate asset is any asset that was individually owned by the decedent and did not have a beneficiary designation. So a classic example of that is a bank account. So if the decedent had a, a bank account in his or her name alone and didn't list a person to whom the account should pass to upon death, well, then that's a probate asset. And the only person who can um, gain access to that asset is the person appointed as the personal representative of the estate by the court. So on the other hand, we have non-probate assets. Um, so a non-probate asset is any asset that's jointly owned with the decedent. So an example would be a joint bank account. Another uh, non-probate asset is a bank account with a, a transfer, somebody named as a transfer on death, or an account that has a beneficiary designation. So that can be um, an IRA, a 401k, uh, an annuity, or a life insurance policy. And finally, any assets that are in trust um, will are considered non-probate and can avoid this court process. Okay, so if it's all non probate assets say the only thing that this person had was a life insurance policy and a bank account that had a, a TOD beneficiary, then the, there's not really that much to do, right? They just contact the uh, life insurance company and the bank and whoever the beneficiary is gets the Exactly. So in, in that situation, um, there would be no reason um, to go through the tedious uh, probate process. Everything would pass outside of probate. Okay. Um, and there, there are some issues that come up even in that situation, and I, which I think we'll get to later. 
Uh, but okay, so assume that we have some probate assets, maybe we have real estate that was owned in, um, in the person's name, then, uh, so, so then, then where, where do we go from there? Well, the next step is to um, look for an original will. So if the, your loved one um, told you that they had a will and told you where it was being kept, well, that's going to make your job a whole lot easier. Um, otherwise, you're going to need to do some due diligence and you're going to need to search for that will. So you'll have to look through their apartment, uh, reach out to any attorneys you know that they may have worked with. Uh, if you know that they have a safe deposit box at a bank, you'll need to get an order from the court in order to open that, uh, that box so that you can see if there's a will in there. And I, I think that's a really good point because a lot of times uh, I think people think that they should put their wills in their safe deposit boxes. Uh, but if they're not there to open the safe deposit box, then um, that that's not really a, a great plan. So um, we, in order to access the will, if you think that it's in a safe deposit box, we actually have to file a motion with the court to order it to be to be accessed. That's right. And I just want to point out here that if you do find an original will, you shouldn't take the staples out to make photocopies or tamper with the document in any way, because it can cause issues down the road when you try to file that will in court. The court is very suspicious of any document that looks like it has been um, altered in any way. Okay, so if we find a will, then um, I assume that we, we call the lawyer and say we have the will. Um, what, do, what do we do next? Um, if there is no will, then, um, then what happens then? Yeah, so I was gonna say, if there is a will, the person who's named as the executor is uh, responsible for um, filing the will along with a petition and ultimately managing the estate. And that process is called probate. If there is no will, then um, it, we go through a process called administration. And it's a fairly um, identical process, except there are some minor differences, which we will discuss throughout this presentation. One major difference is that in a will, as I just mentioned, there is an executor who's named to manage the estate. If there is no will, then there is a statute which uh, dictates who has priority to serve as the administrator. Uh, and the administrator has the same um, responsibilities and obligations as an executor has. Okay, so a lot of times we use these terms of state administration and probate interchangeably uh, in kind of layman's terms, but in the, um, in law they, they have particular, uh, particular meanings that the probate means that there's a will and you're submitting it to the court to to verify it and that's kind of the probate of the will and then estate administration is where there um there is no will and, and things are going in intestate um but sometimes again for lay purposes that those things are used interchangeably okay so let's go through an overview um, of the process so we we have say we have a will so the um executor calls the attorney and, and then what, what happens from there? So the first step is to uh, prepare and file the petition. And there's very specific information that's included on the petition. Uh, so first the um, personal representative has to list all of the deceased's heirs or distributees, which are the closest living family members, even if they're not named as beneficiaries in the will. And the reason is, is because they are required to receive notice of the proceedings. There are two ways in which they can receive notice. Uh, the first is by sending them a waiver and consent for them to sign. Basically, that says that they uh, consent to the will being admitted to probate, and they consent to the person who's petitioning uh, being appointed as the representative of the estate. If they refuse to sign that waiver, then the personal representative has to send a, them has to serve them with a citation, and that citation states the date and time that they would need to appear in court if they want to object. To the proceedings and so you're saying that even if somebody is not named in the will they still have to get notice that's exactly right so again the distributees or or the heirs it's used interchangeably they are required to receive notice even if they are not named in the will so the heirs meaning like heirs at law as like as in somebody who would um receive the assets if there had been no will exactly right exactly right and this petition that you're talking about, what is a, a petition for? What are we petitioning the court for? So the executor is petitioning to have the will admitted to court and also for um, 
to also to be admitted um, as, or to be appointed as the executor of the estate. Okay, great. Um, okay, so so then we we file the petition, um, and then and then what happens? Uh, just some additional information that's going to be included on the petition. Um, each beneficiary of the will has to be listed because they are also entitled to notice of the proceeding, and the value of the estate must be included on the petition as well. And that's going to dictate uh, the filing fee that's required. Now, after the petition is filed. It's really just a waiting game. You wait for the court to review everything. Sometimes they'll come back to you and ask for additional information or documentation. Otherwise, um, you wait for the judge to review and approve the petition and to officially appoint the executor and issue what's called letters testamentary. Now, this is what gives that personal representative the legal authority to act on behalf of the estate. Okay, and can the executor or the administrator do anything um... What like can what can they do while they're waiting for for the the court to act? Really, nothing. <laughs> they have no authority to act without those letters, and no financial institution will give them any information or give them any access to the accounts until they see a copy of that letter testamentary. Okay. So during that time, if bills need to be paid, you know, co-op fees, mortgages, um, even you know things for the family. There's, there's no way to um, access the funds to be able to pay those things. Correct. Okay. Um, okay, so we wait for the court, we get the letters, um, and then, then what's the next? So they have now the authority to act. So what do we do next? So the next step is to gather or collect the estate assets. So that means liquidating bank accounts, selling um, personal property, um, managing any real property that's owned, either renting it or selling it, um, if there's a business, if the decedent owned a business, then continuing the operations of the business. And once there are some assets in the estate, well, then the executor has the ability to pay estate debts. So that's going to include um, medical bills, credit card bills, any other debts that were incurred um, while the decedent was living. Um, and then also the executor has to pay any expenses incurred while administering the estate. So that will include attorney's fees or accountant's fees, um, real property expenses, anything required to, to kind of upkeep the estate. And the executor is also responsible for filing an estate tax uh, for filing a tax return for the year in which decedent passed, and in certain situations, filing an estate tax return as well. And what happens if the um, the executor just didn't pay these debts and just said, "Well, you know, I, I think." I'd rather just give it to the people and who are in the will. Um, I don't really care about um, American Express getting its uh, its share of the credit card debt. Oh, well, the executor has the obligation to ensure that the whatever outstanding debts there are are legitimate. But if there are debts and they uh, the creditor can prove that they're legitimate, then the executor has the responsibility to pay the debts. There's no way sort of around that. Then what? What if they just don't? I mean, I have the the uh, checking account i can write a check to whoever i want as the executor so say i um just distribute all of the money uh what i mean what what is really american express going to do yeah the executor can be held personally liable if there was money in the estate to pay the debt and the executor um, distributed the money and didn't pay any of the debts well then they can go after the, personally go after the uh, the, the executor Okay, so um, and can they just kind of pretend they they can't just pretend these debts don't exist? Like no, that's, that's not that's not them, turn a blind that, eye. That that's not really an option. Again, they cannot be held personally responsible, so it's never a good idea to pretend they don't exist. Um, the funds should come out of the estate um, so that the executor won't have to reach into his or her own pocket to pay. Okay. Um, and then is there but i mean i feel like there could be debts coming out of anywhere i mean how do we even know like maybe we if we're like the amex bill or something we have some of that information maybe and in they have the statements in their filing cabinet um and we're getting bills but maybe something comes up later on like a year from now and you get a bill uh, can they still go after the executor so creditors have seven months from the date that the executor was appointed to make a claim against the estate. So there is a, a time limit here. And so after, if the executor makes a distribution after those seven months, well, then that executor will not be held personally liable. Okay, so there's kind of a, a incentive for the 
executor to wait those seven months before making the distribution if they want to make sure that they are not held personally liable for any debts that come Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because sometimes what can happen, I, I think, is that they make, they make the distribution to the beneficiaries, and then if they are responsible for the debt, they don't have the money then to pay. They would have to go after all of the beneficiaries, which would be pretty problematic. Right. It seems. Okay. Um, okay, so we've paid the debt. Uh, what, what, what more do we do? So the executor is responsible for filing an inventory of assets with the surrogate's court. And that's just a form letting the court know what um, probate assets that it seemed owned, what non-probate assets they owned, and the value of the probate estate. And this is to ensure that the proper filing fee was paid when the petition was initially filed. Okay. And we have to put the non-probate assets in there? They're, they just want to know about the non-probate assets. You don't have to list them. They just ask certain questions. Did, did the decedent own a joint bank account? Did the decedent own um, any retirement benefits that had a designated beneficiary? So it's really just checking yes or no. Um, again, they just want to know if they existed. There's really not much more information you need to include. Okay, so we file the inventory with the court, and then can um, can we get the money now? So there are a few steps before before that happens. So once the executor is ready to wrap everything up, um, an accounting is is compiled, and the accounting is lets the beneficiaries know what assets came into the estate, what assets left the estate to pay debts and expenses, and what's remaining uh, to be distributed to the beneficiaries. Now that's sent to the beneficiaries along with what's called a receipt and release agreement. And the agreement states that the beneficiaries release the executor from all liability and consent or, and acknowledge um, receipt of their distribution. Once they've signed and returned to that agreement, the executor can distribute the remaining funds to the beneficiaries and close out the estate. Okay. And what if somebody doesn't sign this, um, this waiver? So if someone refuses to sign the waiver, I always recommend that our clients file what's called a formal accounting in court. So it does require a lot more information and documentation, but the court reviews the accounting and then um, will hopefully approve it. And then um, they are released from liability um, because the judge has approved it and they no longer need the um, signed release agreement from the, from the beneficiary. Okay. Um, okay, so then we could get the money. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so next I want, and I see there's a couple of questions um, in the Q&A and we will get to those, but I just wanna make sure we get through everything before we address the specific questions. Um, so let's talk about the the time period because sometimes, um, you know, here probate can be pretty quick in some places or probate can take a really long time. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Like, how long does this process take? So for, before COVID, for simple estate, that's an estate where, you know, all the family members are on board. There really are no complications. There's no additional information or documentation that's required. It was taking, um, I would say, three to six months for the court to appoint a, a personal representative. However, since COVID has started, the courts are inundated with cases. They're really a significant backlog. They're dealing with reduced staff and limited court hours. And we're seeing across the board in every county, it's taking at least a year before a executor or uh, administrator is appointed. So that's one year when no bills can be paid, like the money just is sitting there. That's exactly right. And, and that's again for a simple estate, if there are any complications. so. If there's information that the court needs that the executor just doesn't have, or if there's um, unknown heirs that you can't find, that can end up delaying, causing significant delays. And then if anybody uh, appears to object or contest to the will, well, then we could be dealing with years of delays. And ultimately, the will may never be admitted if the, uh, if the objections are successful. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that the, the, short of this answer is that it takes a very long time and um, it takes far more time now than it had prior to COVID. Exactly right. Okay. And so what are the, it seems like there could be some problems um, that would arise during this time when we're waiting. 
Yeah, so you mentioned earlier, there's no access to the money during this time. And so this is particularly problematic if the decedent had, let's say, minor children or an incapacitated individual that they were supporting. No one can continue those payments until they've been appointed. It means there's also nobody who can pay um, any sort of estate expenses. So if the decedent owned a property, um, the co-op fees can be accruing or there might be um, insurance or a mortgage that needs to be paid. Again, no one has access to the money to pay those um, expenses, and inevitably the estate is going to incur penalties, and that'll mean that there's just less money at the end of the day to distribute to the beneficiaries. It's also problematic if the decedent owned any stock, particularly a volatile stock, uh, because there's nobody who can sell that stock um, while this is all pending, and that can result in significant loss for the estate. And then finally, uh, if the decedent owned a business, there's nobody who can continue the business operations until they've been appointed. So there really are a lot of negative um, implications for these delays. Okay. Um, okay. So th that's just even on a simple estate, but let's talk about what are some of the complicating factors that could cause this to be even longer and more drawn out and more burdensome. Yeah. So there are complications that can arise through every stage of the process, but even from the very beginning, um, if you know that the decedent had a will and you are just unable to locate the original, um, you're going to have problems because the court will very rarely accept a photocopy of a will. There's really a limited, um, limited circumstances. Uh, for example, if um, an attorney was holding on to the original um, and mistakenly um, threw it out, you know, they can submit some sort of affidavit explaining the circumstances. But other than that, if the original cannot be located, the court will assume that the decedent um, revoked that will, intended to destroy it. And so um, you'll have to end up going through the administration process and the uh, statute will dictate who is entitled to the assets. And that might be entirely different than who the uh, decedent actually wanted their assets to go to. Yeah, and I, I think this is something that surprises a lot of people, especially younger people, that the original signed ink document is required uh, because we just have so much these days can just be done electronically. Uh, but for wills, we still need an actual original signed paper copy. And um, there can only be one copy of that will. So it's not like you can do, we'll sign a bunch of originals and then we'll have all of these originals. So if we miss it. If one is misplaced, then we have all of these other, these other documents, these other originals. You really, there is just one original will. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So if we can't find the will, then basically the whole, the whole plan is just out of, it, it's just gone down the toilet. Like there's, there's, it, 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 we're starting from scratch as if there was no will at all. Um, and I want to just emphasize the one point that you did make about the, an exception to this rule. So generally, if there is, um, if we don't have the original will, if we just have a photocopy, it will be nearly impossible to get that photocopy admitted to the court because we have to prove that the decedent didn't revoke it didn't tear it up, um, the original, or didn't do whatever. And it's obviously very hard to prove a negative, um, especially when somebody is no longer around. Uh, that's why it's so difficult. But there is this one exception, which is if an attorney had custody of the original will, and they can testify, they can write an affidavit that they had had custody of the will and they misplaced it. In that case, we know that the decedent hadn't revoked it because it was in the custody, hadn't torn it up or shredded it because it was in the custody of the lawyer. So that is one of the benefits of kind of having your uh, your will held by the lawyer um, and also just prepared by the lawyer because I think that when there are any will contests that it's definitely having had a lawyer involved in the process, there is a benefit of the doubt that's given um, for that process is, is kind of my understanding. And Jamie, you chime in if, if that's yep. correct. Yep, exactly. Okay, um, okay, next other complications. Yeah, so if there is a, a minor or incapacitated heir or beneficiary, then the court automatically appoints what's called a guardian ad litem. This is a neutral third party who um, 
appears to represent their interests. So it's another party to the proceeding. They're going to do their own due diligence. They're going to have to um, file a report with the court. And this can cause delays and um, other issues down the road. Um, additionally, if the uh, minor or incapacitated person is entitled to any distribution, the executor can't make the distribution directly to that person. A guardian of the property has to uh, be appointed by the court. Again, that's going to end up causing delays, especially in the distribution phase. So even if the minor children aren't receiving anything, we still have to have this um, guardian ad litem reported, um, appointed. So even if, say, I'm married, I'm leaving everything to my spouse, and we have kids, but I just want everything to go to my spouse, um, still the court needs to appoint somebody for the kids? Yeah, in that situation, a, a guardian ad litem would, it, it's within the discretion of the court. So in that situation, a guardian might not be appointed. In most cases, a guardian will be appointed. And if it's the situation you just described, it's a fairly simple or it's more straightforward. Um, it tends to be um, more complicated if, um, you know, if it's an incapacitated person and they're not, it's not, we're not dealing with a spouse or, or, or children. And, um, you know, the further away you get, um, further down the family line you get, the more complicated it can be. Um, you know, and, and that's going to depend on how um, how diligent the guardian tends to be. Okay, um, so this guardian, they their job is to basically make sure that there was no that the will is valid. So it's sort of another person looking in to see. Um, and we just a colleague of mine just had a, a situation where uh, the, the, the guardian ad litem, um, wanted to talk to the notary who notarized the will. And, in that case that we knew who the notary was, it wasn't a problem. Uh, but if they had used like a notary at the bank, that might not be so easy. So, um, so even these things, even if in a simple case can end up, you're, you're going to also just have more time delays, um, and aggravation. Uh, okay, other other complications that we might run into. Yes, yeah, so another complication is if you're unable to identify or locate the heirs at law. So I mentioned earlier that in the petition, you need to um, list all of the heirs. Now, if you don't know who the heirs are, or you just have no idea where they live, well, that's going to cause issues. The court is going to require you to do due diligence, and depending on the size of the estate, the court might require you to hire a genealogist to do some digging. Um, this is going to cause significant delays and can actually end up being very expensive. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think that if there is a case, especially where we see if there's not close heirs, if there's not siblings or, or children or parents, um, that's where we want to make sure that the um, you know, that this this is going to kind of cause additional work. Uh, so we might want to be be wary of that. And that can cause. So and if you have any clients um, who are in that situation, it, this is something we want to kind of put a red flag on. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, other other issues. So lack of cooperation from these heirs. So if they are willing to sign a waiver, well, then that makes this process a lot simpler and it, it'll make it go a lot faster. Um, but if they refuse to sign a waiver, as I mentioned earlier, you have to serve them with a citation. Um, that citation needs to be served within a certain time period. And so that can cause delays also. If you can't serve them um, properly on time, you're gonna have to get another citation. This can cause at least a month of delays, sometimes even more. Um, but these heirs can also, even if they are helpful in the beginning, they can also cause issues for the executor at the later stages of the process. Um, so um, during the accounting phase, they can require a formal accounting at any time, and they can also object to an accounting um, if they don't agree with the actions the executor has taken. Okay, so if we have, and I think we'll see this on the next one of, um, well, I think one of the times we see this a lot is with blended families. We have um, a, a step parent and a second spouse, and um, the the children uh, the of the prior marriage. Then they don't have interests that are aligned with the surviving spouse. Um, and uh, so, I don't know if you want to talk to that a little at all. Uh, yeah. So um, we're talking about blended families. Yeah. So. 
yeah, the, I see this particularly problematic when um, the decedent didn't have a will. Um, because there's nothing saying who the assets should go to. If they were all living in the house together, um, there's no indication as to who has the right to live there, what should happen with the house. And we see this all the time that even when um, the family had you know, a cordial relationship or even a close relationship, when um, the decedent passes, things tend to become very tense and the relationship quickly deteriorate. Um, you know, we see this all the time with um, second spouses and children from a first marriage or children from a first marriage and children from a second marriage. There tends to be a lot of resentment and anxiety around this process. Um, and there really is a breakdown of communication and a lot of fighting during these, during these times. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's also, it's just important when we have blended families for the plan to be really clear as to who is getting what and what happens. And, and just think about like who is living in that property. Is there a vacation home? Or do people, are they generally there? So if you're then going to leave it to one or the other, is the other then going to have the ability to use the property? Or we may have a situation where the adult child was living with the parent and now the house is going to the, the second spouse and then the child could just be completely like out of luck they have, have no place to live right okay assets in multiple jurisdictions so if uh, the decedent owned assets in any other state, a separate proceeding called an ancillary proceeding will have to be uh, commenced in that state to gain access to that asset. So if, for example, the decedent owned uh, real property in Massachusetts, then the executor has to retain an attorney in Massachusetts uh, to, to uh, file an ancillary proceeding so that they can gain access to that real property. Uh, each state has their own um, probate laws. So again, it's important uh, to retain a separate counsel in that state. Um, it becomes even more complicated if the decedent owned an asset abroad because that process is entirely different. Okay, so even if it's just within the US, um, if we have multiple assets in multiple states, basically we're going through this whole process twice. Exactly right. Okay, um, and we talked a little bit about will contest, uh, but but I think that's an area where uh, that that is going to cause a tremendous amount of delays um, if there there is any question about whether the will was was properly executed. That's right. It's going to cost a significant amount of delays, and it's going to be very expensive if somebody appears to contest the will. Um, there are really three main. Okay, <laughs> we can. All right. <laughs> change the, the slide. I think we, I want to uh, make sure we get to everything. Um, okay, so and then so those are kind of complicating factors, but even with a very simple estate, then there are just a lot of issues that are inherent in this whole process, no? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first lack of privacy. So <clears throat> as soon as the will and the petition are filed, they are public documents. That means that anybody can go to the courthouse and look and print those documents. That's particularly problematic if um, the decedent wanted to disinherit a family member or leave unequal distributions between family members because there's no way to prevent them from finding out about it. Um, additionally, the value of the assets are on the petition. So you know that's something that people normally don't want shared with everybody. They don't normally want that information public, but anybody can see the value of your assets and what real property you owned. So yeah, and I mean, you still in New York, um, in New York City, you still have to go into the um, courthouse at this point. But the trend is across the country is we're moving to online document um, management and records. So in a lot of counties, you can just go online and pull up a will. Like you don't even have to go into the courthouse. So, um, so this is just I think kind of ripe for. Uh, for identity fraud or identity, yeah, identity fraud and theft, uh, and and then even just sometimes it will see specific things that are left in the will to somebody. So, for example, um, you might see my two carat diamond ring goes to uh, my daughter Susie, and Susie, as we'll have already on the petition, we have exactly Susie's address, right? So, if anybody was looking to commit a theft, that's kind of like a whole roadmap. Um, so these are things that, you know, if even if we do have somebody going through the probate process, we want to make sure that those um, those things are, are are not laid out specifically in the um, in the will. 
Yeah, another issue is that um, it tends to be expensive. So there's a filing fee that's required at the beginning of the process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a guardian ad litem appointed, well, their fees come from the estate. And uh, generally, uh, you're going to need an attorney to walk you through this process. So the attorney's fees um, can you know, can be high, especially if there's litigation, the, the fees can really become astronomical. So probate is certainly not an inexpensive uh, endeavor. Can you give us some ballpark as to what, you know, say, I, I know if it's litigation and the sky's the limit, basically, no. and in terms of could be millions of dollars. Um, but in a sort of a pretty basic, simple estate, what are we looking at? Um, so there's no such thing as a really a simple estate because things, you know, always pop up, but, you know, for, for argument's sake, you know, if it's really simple, um, all of the families on board, um, the court really doesn't need any other information or documentation. Um, when we're talking about attorney's fees, you're kind of in the range of you know, 2,500 to, to 3,500. Um, if there are, like I said, any complications, then, you know, you're really looking at a starting point of 5,000 um, and then it can jump from there. Yeah, and, and that's where kind of their minor beneficiaries is everybody, you know, signing everything, um, then the, those things just make it a lot more expensive and they come up a lot. Okay, and then some of the other things that I feel like in this process that we see is, is not even like dollars and cents or anything like sort of um, concrete, but um, but the kind of just administrative burden on the executor and the emotional toll, they've just lost a loved one. Now they have to deal with all of this paperwork and all of these filings and they have a guardian ad litem that they're reporting to and the court and it's just can be really um, overwhelming and, and burdensome to go through that process during that morning time. Yeah, exactly. And the administrative burden can be significant, especially if the decedent didn't leave some sort of inventory of assets or roadmap as to where their assets are located. The executor is going to need to do a lot of work to try to figure out, you know, where they did their banking, what assets they owned. Um, and then the emotional toll also, that that's a really big factor um, because a lot of times families might be resentful um, that the decedent chose a particular person to serve as the executor, or they just might not agree with the decisions the executor is making. Um, and so that, you know, they tend to, there tends to be a lot of fighting between family members, and that really does take a toll on the executor. There's a lot of pressure put on them during this process. And, and like you were saying, when there is no the decedent hadn't left a list of their assets and hadn't shared what, what where do they bank, what brokerage accounts they have, um, you know, if they have any intellectual property, if they have any digital assets, cryptocurrency, then um, the executor's job is made a lot harder. So even if you have the documents perfectly in place, and we, we do see this a lot that people say, okay, all my documents are in place, but there's, nobody knows what they had and it, it's um, it just makes it incredibly difficult and that's why when we work with clients we make sure that in addition to their documents that we also work with them to make sure that they have a list of all of their assets so that the executor knows exactly what they need to do um, in, in that situation right okay so finally um how to avoid probate so if we this sounds like a really terrible process to put anyone through. So how do, what do we wanna do if we want to protect our loved ones and we don't want to have them have to go through this process? So there are really two main ways to avoid probate. Um, the first is um, designating a beneficiary on your accounts. Um, so while this avoids probate, it does have certain other complications or issues. Um, so the first is you can't do any tax planning this way. So um, there's no way to reduce any estate um, tax that may be due or to minimize it. Um, additionally, if a charity is listed as a beneficiary and that charity is not in existence, or if a beneficiary uh, predeceases, well, then it's as if no beneficiary was designated and this needs to go through probate anyway. So you're, you're at get square one. Additionally, if a, a minor is named as a beneficiary, well, then that asset, the funds will be distributed to a parent or guardian until that minor turns 18. Once they turn 18, it's going to go to, through the court, correct? If it's, the minor is named as the beneficiary, you're back basically in court. You're back in court, and then the minor has full access to that money when they turn 18. So 
not many 18 year olds are financially responsible and savvy. And so it's never a good idea for them to have access to large sums of money. Um, additionally, if, um, if you do it through a beneficiary designation, well, then there's nobody who's sort of in charge of wrapping up the debts and expenses. So there's nobody who's in charge to pay for the funeral expenses or any other expenses that need to be taken care of. Um, and finally, there's a lack of asset protection. So any money that's uh, distributed outright to a beneficiary doesn't have the benefit of any creditor protection. Okay, yeah, so I think that in some situations, this kind of a planning can be fine. I'll also add that if you have joint accounts or any assets that are jointly owned that would apply to this as well, the survivor automatically gets ownership. Um, and this could be a great planning tool if you have um, all adult beneficiaries uh, and you, especially if you only have one beneficiary, I think that's where it does, it's the best, um, it, it works the best. So if you have like a pretty simple situation, uh, then this can be a, a good way to do the planning. But if you have multiple beneficiaries, sometimes what I see is that clients will come to me and say, okay, I wanna leave this account to my niece, um, Susie and I want to leave this account to Johnny and you know my apartments to so and so, although you would have to put them on their the name uh, on, on the deed. But at the time then they pass, there they might there's going to be a completely different amounts of money in each of those accounts. So what you originally had in mind for each of the beneficiaries may not end up at all being what they get. And so that's where um, you know we can see this planning going awry. Whereas, kind of, if everything goes into a central place, we can say thirty percent goes to Johnny and twenty percent goes to Susie or or whatever. And we could also put in you know language about charities. That if the charity is not in existence, then what happens? We give it to another charity with a similar mission. Do we have the executor make the decision? Um, we can do a lot of contingency planning. Uh, also, as Jamie mentioned, tax planning, credit shelter trusts, um, Q-tip trusts, uh, and also New York estate tax cliff planning. So you don't get stuck in that uh, kind of purgatory where if you go over the estate tax exemption, you automatically are gonna owe uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We can kind of divert that to charity. Uh, and and save the beneficiaries money actually so um so those are kind of the reasons why sometimes this type of planning can be be great and very simple but in if it's anything but a very simple plan then um doing what we would do a revocable living trust um is the better option where we could do kind of like the whole plethora of of planning and be much more thorough in terms of contingency and and taxes than we would be able to on a transfer on death and also doing that important asset protection planning to make sure that you know the the money doesn't end up going to your daughter-in-law or your son-in-law and that's always a triggering um idea for, for for someone that they their in-laws could end up with with the money so um so those are that's i think um a, a pretty broad overview and hopefully that was helpful uh, i want to get to some of the the questions anything jamie that you want to add before we move on to our questions no i think that you you covered it um just to um reiterate the revocable trust um the, the benefit also is that the creator or the grantor has complete control over that trust while they're alive. So they can amend it, they can revoke it, they can add assets, remove assets. So there really is a lot of benefits to creating this trust. And we can really um, particularize each trust and the provisions of each trust to um, each of our clients' individual needs. Uh, okay, so moving on to questions. Uh, the first one is when you say heirs are notified, is that children and siblings, parents, nephews, nieces. Um, so the heirs are the heirs at law, meaning who would inherit if there was no will. So if you have um, children, say you're not married and you have children, all of your children would be notified because they would be the ones who would take under the will or if there was no will. 
Uh, so if you were going to leave one of them out because one of them was estranged, then they would have to be notified. And some, and we've had cases where that person, we don't even know where they are. It's really hard to locate them. And then we have to prove to the court we did due diligence to find them. Um, so there are situations where that the, those kinds of things definitely arise. Um, but the only time like nieces and nephews would be notified is if they were the ones they were the next ones in line in the family tree so um it would be sort of the so you would look at what what is the family situation and basically like the next of ken uh under the law would be the ones who would be notified okay um is there a minimal estate like $150,000 that bypasses the probate process or does that still go through the court? Jamie, you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah, so as long as there's a probate asset, it has to go through the court process. So there is what's called a small estate proceeding. So if um, the decedent owned um, up to $50,000 in assets, um, they can not own real property, then you can do a small estate proceeding. It's a dollar filing fee and it just requires a lot less information and documentation. And the court tends to review those petitions much faster. Um, but other than that, there really is no other way to um, sort of avoid the full probate proceeding. And what is the dollar amount for that for a small estate? Yeah, so that's a, a dollar filing fee. Oh, no, no, I mean, in oh. terms of when do you qualify, like the amount of oh, yeah, so, right, so, so fifty that so if it's under fifty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars. OK. Um, OK, that's was actually the next question. Is there a de minimis rule for those who do not open a probate proceeding if they have below a certain amount of probate assets in the state of New York? And uh, again, any time you have a probate asset, it has to go through probate. And we even have cases where sometimes it's a couple thousand dollars or you know five thousand dollars. It's like, well, do we even go through with it? So sometimes money is just left because it's such a small amount, and the what you would have to go through to get it is just not worth it. Um, okay, how does one deal with some financial institution like Wealthfront that did not allow trust ownership or changing the title to joint account to a trust without selling the positions? So will this be part of the probate process, even if there is a pour over will? Um, so I think the question is, if you can't put the assets into the trust because the financial institution doesn't allow that, um what can they 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 you want why don't you tell tell us what would happen in that situation if we had a pour over will meaning that you had a will that says i leave everything to my trust so if an asset wasn't transferred into the trust it has to go through the probate process so that's going to the pour over will will just um ensure that the assets get to the trust so that's at the distribution phase but there really is no way to avoid the probate proceeding because the financial institution will not release the funds or the assets um to anybody unless they've been officially appointed by the court um, to serve as the executor or the administrator okay final question uh compared to other states like florida new jersey and massachusetts how is the probate court process in the state of new york in terms of difficulty time cost etc i think each state has their own process and it's probably fairly similar all of them are probably fairly similar i do know that california tends to be extremely expensive so um, if you speak to an estate attorney in um in, in california they will tell you to avoid probate at all costs and to create a trust um, I know in Massachusetts, they have certain rules about um, selling real property and that complicates and delays proceedings. So each state really has their own process and it's hard to, to compare and contrast. Um, they're probably all fairly similar in that they are all painful and they all take a long time and, and tend to be very expensive. Yeah, and, and I think it also depends, like we are saying, in terms of uh, one, where in New York are you? Are you I know, in a, a county where the court is quick? Are you in a different county? Um, so they can vary dramatically, even just, you know, crossing the river. And um, so, so in, also in terms of like, when is this happening? So like we said pre prior to COVID that the process was a lot quicker than now after COVID we're, we're seeing crazy delays. So, um, so there are a lot of uh, circumstances that I think go into that analysis. Okay, so I hope that this was helpful. Um, and if there's anything else that we can be um, 
you know, of assistance with. If you have any follow up questions, feel free to um, contact us. Uh, my email address is shannon at the village law firm dot com and Jamie um, is Jamie at the village law firm dot com. Uh, and there our phone number is is up on the screen. So um, and if there any way that we can be helpful, feel free to reach out. And um, it was great to have you join us today.